Recently, there has been an upsurge of interest and concern over defence, and the activities in the South Atlantic in 1982 focused great attention on the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines. The conflict with Argentine forces made many people realise the need for a well-balanced conventional navy and the requirement to retain the flexibility to deploy this sea power worldwide. I shall say more about the Falklands campaign later, but first we should consider what our major interests are at sea and where the main strategic threat to these interests lies. Let us start then by reminding ourselves of Britain's dependence on the sea. As an island nation, close to the continent of Europe, the United Kingdom depends vitally on the free use of the sea to sustain itself. We are not a self-sufficient nation, and to feed ourselves and maintain our industry, we must import food and raw materials. To pay for these, we need to export manufactured goods abroad. Nowadays, most people tend to think only of air travel, but as far as trade is concerned, by far the most practical and economic means of transport is by sea. And 95% of the weight of our entire trade is still carried in ships. The United Kingdom and other countries of Western Europe could not survive without a minimum of 1,000 shiploads every month of essential foods and critical raw materials. On any one day, there are over 300 ocean-going merchant ships and a further 400 smaller vessels loading or discharging their cargoes in ports around the United Kingdom. Increasingly, many of these ships are foreign. This year, over two-thirds of Britain's trade will be carried in foreign ships. Even so, our own merchant fleet still contributed over £1,000 million towards our balance of payments last year. Freedom to use the seas for the peaceful purpose of trading is therefore vital to us, not only to our economic trading position and prosperity, but in the case of our imports of food and minerals, to our very survival. Twice this century our country has come close to defeat after almost losing control of the seas, and it would be foolish to forget these lessons of recent history. The sea is also an important source of oil and gas. Fish, and possibly in the future, of minerals too. Despite the reduction in distant water fishing, our fishing fleet still employs 10,000 people, and the fishing grounds around our coasts must be policed to ensure that stocks are conserved. Offshore oil and gas from the North Sea are crucial to our economy and need protection against accidental damage, sabotage or possible aggression. Unlike the predominantly coastal defence navy of the past, the Soviet navy today is a powerful ocean-going fleet. The largest ships of the Soviet fleet are their aircraft carriers, the Kiev class. Three are already in service and a fourth is under construction. They carry a mix of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft and anti-submarine helicopters. They also carry powerful anti-ship missiles with a range of almost 300 miles. And expected at the end of the decade is a much larger class of aircraft carrier, possibly nuclear powered, and with catapults and arrestor gear for operating conventional fixed wing aircraft. The recently introduced nuclear powered cruiser Kirov marks an important development in the technical evolution of Soviet sea power. Some 25,000 tonnes, she is the largest surface warship other than an aircraft carrier to be built in the world for 35 years and is as large as a battleship of the last war. 
She has a new generation of surface-to-surface -surface missiles with a 270-mile range, a new surface-to-air missile of high capability, and anti-submarine missiles. Three other classes of major surface ships have also appeared in recent years. A large missile cruiser able to act as a command ship and provide a Soviet battle group with enhanced air defense and surface strike capabilities. A new destroyer, the first Soviet big gunship to be constructed since the 1950s. And this ship would be ideal for supporting Soviet amphibious forces. The third edition is another class of destroyer designed for anti-submarine warfare and fitted with the latest version of naval helicopter. Soviet amphibious forces are also continuing to improve. The latest ship, the Ivan Rogov, which is more than twice the displacement of any previous Soviet amphibious ship, joins some 80 other amphibious units and can carry hovercraft for landing assault troops over the beach, as well as an entire naval infantry battalion and supporting vehicles, tanks and helicopters. All these ships provide the Soviet Navy with an increased flexibility and the capability to project their influence worldwide. To support these operations, composite replenishment ships like Beretsina or fleet oilers such as the Boris Shilikin class have been introduced. The Soviet Navy has the largest submarine fleet in the world, over 450 of them nine times as many as the German Navy had at the start of the Second World War. And they maintain a launch rate of a new submarine every six weeks. Some of their ballistic missile firing submarines have missiles with ranges over 5,000 miles. And soon to join the fleet is the largest submarine in the world, the Typhoon. It is as big as an aircraft carrier and more than 5,000 tons heavier than Invincible. The cruise missile firing submarines could threaten NATO shipping with their missiles from up to 300 miles away. In 1980, the first of the new, extremely large Oscar-class guided missile submarines was launched, a submarine capable of firing up to 24 long-range anti-ship cruise missiles while submerged. Last but not least are the attack submarines, both conventional and nuclear-powered. Their job is to protect their own missile firing submarines, to sink shipping and to lay mines. The new Alpha class is both faster and deeper diving than any NATO submarine. The Soviet Naval Air Force, which supports naval operations, is more than twice the size of the Royal Air Force and, together with some elements of the Soviet Long Range Air Force, provides a formidable reconnaissance, anti-submarine and anti-ship capability. Naval reconnaissance aircraft operate on a regular basis from airfields in Cuba, Angola, Aden and Vietnam, as well as from the Soviet Union. And their latest aircraft, the Backfire Bomber, is being produced at the rate of one aircraft every 11 days. The Soviet merchant fleet has been rapidly expanding too. In 1960, it consisted of less than 800 ships. Today, after a massive investment program, it has more than six times that number. And their ships operate with subsidies at much lower cost than the West could contemplate and provide a growing economic threat to our own merchant ships, whose numbers, by comparison, have fallen from 2,700 to less than 900 ships today. Potential military requirements are taken into account in Soviet design and construction resulting in speeds and capabilities not dictated solely by commercial considerations. The Soviet Union also has the world's largest fishing fleet, and it deploys a greater hydrographic research effort than any other country. All four fleets, Navy, Merchant, Fishing and Research, come under central national control from Moscow, and together with a vast fleet of special intelligence-gathering vessels, provide a worldwide network, unparalleled in peacetime, of readily available eyes, ears and logistic support wherever required to project Soviet influence and political pressure.
The United Kingdom, as a maritime nation by geography, placed at the focus of the busiest sea lanes in the world and beside the main deployment route for Soviet warships, is the natural leader of NATO's European navies and indeed will provide most of the readily available forces in the Eastern Atlantic in the event of a conflict. Our fleet consists of submarines, both nuclear and diesel powered, aircraft carriers, destroyers and frigates, assault ships, mine countermeasures vessels, and offshore patrol craft. And the fleet air arm operates naval helicopters and sea harrier aircraft, and the Royal Marines provide our amphibious infantry. There are two major threats to ships at sea. One posed by the Soviet torpedo firing submarines, and the other by a formidable array of Soviet ship submarine and aircraft launch missiles designed specifically to sink surface ships. To counter these threats, we must maintain a number of different types of forces. The need for this balance is well illustrated in the team necessary for hunting submarines. No one unit provides the solution to the problem. One of the principal anti-submarine warfare vessels is the submarine itself. Apart from the French Navy, the Royal Navy is the only European NATO Navy to operate nuclear-powered attack submarines. At the moment, we have 12, but these numbers are being increased. Nuclear-powered submarines can remain submerged for weeks at a time and dive to great depths. They are faster than most surface ships and are largely unaffected by surface weather conditions. They are armed with both anti-ship and anti-submarine torpedoes and some have anti-ship missiles as well. Working alongside the nuclear submarines are the diesel-powered submarines. Although slower and of less endurance than the nuclears, they are extremely quiet and difficult to detect and ideal for operations in shallower waters. A new class of conventional submarine is planned to enter service towards the end of the 1980s. The anti-submarine aircraft carriers, Hermes, Invincible and Illustrious, followed by Ark Royal, with their sophisticated communications, command and control equipment, provide the platform from which to operate naval aircraft and the facilities for the coordination of widely spread maritime forces engaged in complex anti-submarine operations. The battle is controlled from the operations room where computerized tactical display systems enable decisions to be made rapidly and accurately. The carriers deploy highly capable Sea King anti-submarine helicopters to search out submarines with either sonar boys, which listen and transmit to the helicopter any underwater noise they detect, or with an active sonar which is lowered into the water. Submarines would be attacked with homing torpedoes. The level of expertise in our seeking force is second to none, and our crews can operate effectively by day or night for very long periods, and as they proved in the South Atlantic, in all weathers. Other ships involved primarily in anti-submarine warfare are the frigates. Our most modern are the Type 22s, fitted with the latest submarine detection devices. If a submarine is detected close to, the ship will attack using her own ship-launched acoustic torpedoes. For delivering torpedoes further away, quickly and accurately, frigates carry their own helicopters. The Lynx, a highly versatile and manoeuvrable naval helicopter, 
can operate day or night in nearly all weather conditions and is, without doubt, one of the finest deck landing helicopters in the world. Some ships are fitted with the Icara anti-submarine weapon. On detecting a submarine, the ship will launch a missile and control it to pass close to the target and release a homing torpedo that will locate and destroy the submarine. Icara can also be fired to engage a target held by another ship or helicopter by means of data links. The final member of the anti-submarine team is provided by aircraft and personnel of the Royal Air Force. The Nimrod maritime patrol aircraft is used to detect and track submarines at long range from the force. To sink submarines, it can drop torpedoes, which, once in the water, home in to their target. It is now fitted with an in-flight refueling capability to increase its time on task. So anti-submarine warfare, to be successful, needs a variety of forces. Submarines, frigates with their Lynx helicopters, carriers with the larger Sea Kings and the Nimrod. In addition to anti-submarine warfare, we must be prepared for Soviet air attacks on our shipping by either aircraft or missiles, as well as attacks from their surface ships. As we saw in the Falklands, the Sea Harriers are our first line of defence against air attack. In support of NATO, these will be augmented by American aircraft from the US carrier strike fleet or Royal Air Force aircraft operating from ashore. Airborne early warning to detect targets beyond or beneath the cover of the ship's radars is an essential part of defence against aircraft or missile attack. And this will be provided in the future by RAF Nimrods fitted with a special radar or by units of the American strike fleet. We have also now modified some naval seeking helicopters to carry the search water radar to provide a useful airborne early warning facility within the fleet when these other aircraft are not available. Our ships are fitted with a variety of weapons to defend themselves against aircraft and missile attack. The Type 42 destroyers, HMS Bristol, and the Invincible class carriers are fitted with the medium range Sea Dart. This was the weapon system that forced the Argentine aircraft to fly low to avoid being hit even so accounted for at least eight of their aircraft. They knew that if they flew higher, even more aircraft would be shot down. Against close-range attacks, Sea Wolf, fitted in the Type 22 frigates and some Leander class, provides an instant and automatic reaction to the smallest targets. We have also fitted in Invincible and Illustrious the Vulcan Phalanx gun for short-range protection. And many ships have the fully automatic 4.5-inch gun or smaller caliber weapons for use against aircraft as well as for surface action. surface units can be attacked by Sea Harrier aircraft either with bombs or from far off using the new Sea Eagle missile which is now entering into service. The Lynx helicopter, armed with Sea Skewer missiles, proved its effectiveness against surface units in the Falklands campaign.
surface units can also be engaged by Exocet, fired from our frigates and destroyers. We have more ships fitted with Exocet than any other navy. The sub harpoon missile, now in service with our nuclear-powered submarines, can be launched from below the surface and is particularly effective. The commando forces of the Royal Marines that were so successful in the Falklands have a significant role to play in the defence of NATO's northern flank. The joint United Kingdom-Netherlands amphibious force provides the specialist reinforcements which would be deployed as early as possible as a deterrent operation during a period of tension. The main naval components are the assault ships Fearless and Intrepid and the landing ships Logistic. The force is supported by naval air squadrons operating Sea King and Wessex helicopters. The Royal Marines, who traditionally give the Navy the capability to project the power ashore, are trained to a unique standard to fight in the snows and mountains of northern Norway throughout the Arctic winter in temperatures down to minus 40 degrees centigrade. It was their Arctic equipment and rigorous training that allowed them to march over 50 miles across peat and bog in freezing conditions from San Carlos to Port Stanley and in the process to carry out a series of night assaults in the mountains against well-prepared enemy positions. To support our ships at sea for distant or prolonged operations, it is necessary to keep them supplied with fuel, ammunition, food and stores. This is achieved at sea whilst underway by specially designed support ships of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. These ships are manned predominantly by merchant navy personnel highly practiced in the skills needed for the speedy replenishment of fuel and stores in fair weather and foul. Some also carry civilians of the Royal Navy Supply and Transport Service. These ships are crucial to any prolonged operation and their inclusion in the fleet plays a vital part in keeping the fleet at sea for sustained operations anywhere in the world. was these ships, together with the merchant ships taken up from trade, that enabled the task force to be supported in the South Atlantic 8,000 miles from their home base. So much for those units that provide the flexibility and mobility for operations worldwide. The task of patrolling the vicinity of our offshore oil and gas installations and the surveillance of the 270,000 square miles of our extended fishery limits is undertaken by the Fishery Protection Squadron with Castle Class and Island Class patrol vessels, supported by Ton Class mine countermeasure vessels. Last year, more than 1,500 fishing vessels were boarded and inspected. RAF Nimrod aircraft also assist in the task of reconnaissance of the areas. In case of terrorist attack against the oil and gas installations, the Royal Marines provide a specially trained reaction force at immediate notice. The teams are exercised on a regular basis with a high priority being placed on helicopter and small boat operations and close quarter fighting techniques. Mine countermeasure vessels will attempt to keep the waters around the United Kingdom and Western Europe clear of mines. The Hunt class, the first of which are already at sea, are built of glass reinforced plastic and other non-magnetic materials to ensure their safety. When a mine is located, a remotely controlled vehicle is guided down to lay a charge alongside at a safe distance from the parent ship. The Hunt class are being augmented by a number of trawlers fitted as minesweepers capable of sweeping the deepest mines. They have already shown their capability by sweeping the mines laid at sea by the Argentines off the Falklands. 
Supporting our regular forces will be another squadron of mine countermeasure vessels manned entirely by men of the Royal Naval Reserve. These enthusiastic and dedicated volunteers give up much of their spare time to train and work with the Navy and the Royal Marines. And the existence of this pool of reservists is yet another demonstration to any aggressor of the determination of the people of this country to defend their freedom. Reservists also man shore headquarters and play a major part in the worldwide control of shipping organization in an emergency. The Royal Navy is therefore a balanced modern force ready at any time to play its part in the defense of our country. Nowhere was the need for a balance of forces more apparent than during the Falkland Islands operation. This could not have been carried out without amphibious ships and landing forces. But also we needed frigates and destroyers for air defense, shore bombardment and anti-submarine work. Submarines which effectively bottled up the Argentinian fleet. The carriers with the very successful sea harriers. Naval helicopters for everything from anti-submarine work to logistic support. Minesweepers and the enormous logistic backup from the Royal Fleet Auxiliary and the Merchant Fleet. The Royal Navy also provides the United Kingdom's strategic nuclear deterrent, Polaris, the British contribution to NATO's strategic nuclear forces. These submarines can remain hidden deep in the ocean for long periods. And for the last 14 years, there has never been a moment when our Polaris force did not have at least one submarine on patrol. The new British Chevaline warhead will give us the capability to penetrate Soviet anti-ballistic missile defences into the 1990s. After that date, in order to maintain the credibility of our strategic deterrent, the Trident missile system will be introduced, which will be fitted with British warheads and carried in new British submarines. Each one will be capable of carrying 16 missiles with ranges well in excess of Polaris. None of our submarines or ships could carry out its tasks without a detailed knowledge of the sea around it. This is provided by the Hydrographic Service, at sea and ashore, whose primary job is to produce the charts and oceanographic information for the Royal Navy and its NATO allies. And the products of the Hydrographic Service are sold worldwide. But so much for submarines, ships, aircraft and highly technical weapon systems. No modern weapon or expensive equipment is worth anything without well-trained people to man it. Our defence depends upon the quality and commitment of our uniformed personnel. It was their bravery, skill and determination, as well as the quality of their training and equipment, that was so clearly demonstrated in the Falkland Islands crisis. The Wrens are an integral part of our organisation and play a major part in supporting the operational role of the Navy. They work alongside the men ashore, using the same skills and sharing the same responsibilities. Wren officers fill appointments from administrative and secretarial to computer programming and photographic interpretation. Wren ratings can qualify in 21 different specialisations ranging from aircraft mechanics to photographer or weapons analyst. Supporting our uniform personnel are the civilian staff ashore. In the Royal Dockyards, skilled technicians repair and refit our ships and submarines to the highest standards. Scientists and engineers at naval research and development establishments work alongside their colleagues in industry to develop the ships, weapons and technical equipment necessary to meet our requirements. These then are the ships, submarines, aircraft and equipment we have in the Royal Navy today, together with the people who man them and the men and women of the supporting services, the dockyards, establishments and the defence industries. Apart from everyday tasks like offshore patrol, intelligence gathering or reacting to emergencies, our main job in peace is to exercise, 
train and practice so that we are always at a high level of readiness. This preparedness was tested in 1982. The response was good. We must continue to ensure that you get value for money and that we are ready to meet any demands placed on us by the government.